coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. We're flying without a map. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 143, recorded Thursday, May 10th, 2012. Name it yourself. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is the hour that, yeah, we're just bucking all tradition this week because I have no plan. I have no plan. I mean, I've got science stories for you because I like the science stories, so I've got some science headlines to summarize, but I got no plan. Somehow, I ended up without an interview, and, you know, I'm here. We can talk. But first... A few science headlines. It's May 10th, 2012, and this is the science that made headlines this week. Rare earth element analysis of fossilized human remains found at Vero Beach, Florida in the early 1900s provides evidence that people and large mammals like mammoths, mastodons, that kind of stuff, coexisted in North America nearly 13,000 years ago. The study is published online in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Calculations based on the methane production of modern ruminants like cows suggest that dinosaurs as a group might have produced enough methane to affect the climate. That's right. Methane produced by bacteria living in the guts of dinosaurs would have added some 520 million tons of the gas to the atmosphere annually. So for comparison, that's approximately the same amount of gas currently released into the atmosphere by all sources, human or other. So dinosaurs. Hmm. Interesting. Researchers at Penn State and the University of Maryland examined U.S. government data from the American Time Use Study and concluded that Americans don't get enough exercise. On average, Americans are active only two hours per week as opposed to the recommended two and a half hours a week. Walking was the most popular activity and golf was most prevalent in pe- uh, aside from walking in people over 65. Mouse research suggests a DNA copying error led to the development of the modern human brain. That's right. Some kind of copy was copied wrong and voila, we are here. In the experiment, scientists developed mice genetically modified with a partial gene duplication. That's been implicated in neuronal development and brain formation in humans. The modified mouse neurons made more and more efficient connections similarly to human neurons. However, no mention was made of changes to mouse behaviors. In case you were wondering where the modern domesticated horse got its start, researchers published a genetic study of 300 horses in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Apparently, modern horses originated in the Western Eurasian steppe, comprised of the Ukraine, Southwest Russia, and West Kazakhstan. And a study in science reports that Greenland's melting glaciers aren't speeding up their slide into the oceans as much as was previously thought. Rather, the pace of the glacial melt march is inconsistent, with some glaciers speeding up and others slowing down on a year-to-year basis. The study looked at radar images of 200 glaciers to determine that there has been a 30% increase in speed over the past decade, which corresponds to approximately one meter in increased sea level by the end of the century. According to data from NASA's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX mission, the sun and its associated heliosphere are moving through interstellar space about 7,000 miles per hour slower than previously thought. At 52,000 miles per hour, the impact of the heliosphere with the interstellar medium, it's not enough to create a bow shock, but more of a bow wake. 
And six papers studying the planetoid called Vesta appeared in appear in the journal Science this week. NASA's Dawn mission, led by UCLA, UCLA's Christopher T. Russell, finds not one, but two large impact craters dating from at least one and two billion years ago. Mountains, exposed minerals, a gravitational field suggesting an iron core, and a highly impacted regolith surface. Vesta is a time capsule from the beginning of our solar system, allowing us to see further back into our own history than ever before. And uh, the good news that you've been waiting for all day, the world's not going to end on December 21st, 2012. Archaeologists digging in a Guatemalan rainforest unearthed the chambers of a Mayan scientist, dated to 800 AD. On the wall of the room was a complex Mayan calendar recording thousands of years into the past and into the future. 7,000 years into the future, to be exact, as well as some planetary cycles for Mars and Venus, making it the oldest known Mayan calendar discovered to date. So uh, I hope that you and I will all be celebrating together come December 21st. I think it's December 21st that when everything's supposed to end, but I, I do hope that we will be having a party celebrating not the end of the world. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means that you save time, money, and hassle, which we all like all those three things. There are several easy ways that you can instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch these shows on your Mac or your PC, your home com computer, your iPad if you have an iPad app, iPhone if you have an iPhone app, and even some Android phones as well. If you have a gaming console and maybe not a media computer, you can watch these shows and movies on your TV using something like an Xbox 360, PS3, or a N Nintendo Wii. If you're not a gamer, not a tech aficionado that you want to have your own media computer, you can have a set-top box, like a Roku or an Apple TV, Boxy Box also. These are inexpensive and easy-to-use options. And with Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And the neat feature is the seamless integration of the interface so that you can start on any device, stop at any point, and then pick up exactly where you left off on any other device. Whichever way that you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, any time you want, and you can cancel any time for free. So try Netflix today, 30 days for absolutely free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up. It's netflix.com slash twit for your free trial. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And so this is the part of the show where I usually start interviewing somebody about some topic in the sciences. And today I got nothing. I'm just I'm just putting it putting it right out there. I've got nothing. So chat room, chat room, I I fall back to you, chat room. Uh let me know. Tell me what you think about a uh, something in the sciences. What do you want to talk about? Let's turn this into a science chat. Let's have a discussion. Um, I have a science chat program on Justin TV on Fridays from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time. And we have a great time chatting. And so uh, I'm going to see how that how that works out today. I'm awesome is saying viruses, Dr. Kiki. Okay, I'm awesome. What about viruses? What do we want to know about viruses? There are Millions and millions of viruses. Maybe not vir viral species or strains. I mean, I, I don't even know if we have an exact count of how many uh, viral strains are, would be possible. But we do know that in, uh, say, one drop of seawater, there are millions of viral, of viral particles. Millions of viruses. They're around us everywhere. Uh, viruses are a fascinating topic, and we really don't understand a lot about them. We know that uh, there was news out this week that uh, viruses are involved in uh, some 16% of cancers. So um, infection with a virus <clears throat> is related to 
a significant portion of the cancers that are reported medically. Um, Additionally, uh, with viruses, what what else do we want to know about viruses? The flu virus. There's another bit of news out this week. Um, A group out of the University of British Columbia, I believe, were working uh, are working on a uh, a uh, universal flu vaccine. That's what they're calling it. So, a vaccine that you would take once. So right now we have the seasonal flu vaccine, which uh, the vaccine that's created is created so that uh, based on whatever the other hemisphere was inundated with in the, their, during their winter, during their flu season. So we kind of track what each flu season strain is prominent and what is probably going to end up affecting us. And so those are the, 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 the flu vaccines that are created. And so we, every year you have to get a new flu vaccine because the flu is constantly um, mixing and matching and getting little bits and pieces that make it different. Um, I'm awesome. It says, oh, we heard about that universal vaccine. They broke the top off the hemagglutinin so that you generate immunity to the stock of the protein, which is conserved. Right. So there are different parts of these, of, of the proteins. And so they were talking about um, the hemagglutinin protein, which is a very important part, the HA portion of the uh, of the flu virus. And they can knock one part off of it. And if you can knock one part off of it, you can generate immunity to that stock of the protein. And if then that means generate immunity, it means that if you get the um, uh, the antibodies to that stock of the protein, then any flu that has that HA, that hemagglutinin protein, which would be just about all of them. It's a very highly conserved protein uh, across the flu strains. Then you would be pretty much immune, or you would have a, a a good immune system response to that HA protein. Um, anyway, it's interesting, interesting uh, development. And the the question now, I mean, we've got a bunch of different people, different teams working on these flu vaccines, these universal flu vaccines. Because wouldn't it be nice just to get one shot and never have to worry about it again? And there are a few different uh, routes that they're looking at. And the big question is, okay, technically you can create something in a lab that might work to trigger immunity, to trigger antibodies in people. But then how um, how is it actually going to work in practice? Is it going to uh, actually uh actually be a vaccine that we can that we can use and how long is it going to take to actually get to that point hopefully not so long um is my my text is very small okoquitlem says you've not had the flu for a few years is that good sure it's great you haven't been sick right so personally for your uh, health that's that's great either you have not been exposed or you have a, a very well functioning immune system and you are not uh, and you haven't been infected to the degree that your body has really seriously had to fight fight it off um in the case of individuals though it, it, it if you haven't had the flu for a few years you know it, uh, it I, I don't know what that necessarily means everybody's different uh, uh but probability wise, you'll probably get the flu at some point. So you can decide whether or not the probability of your getting the flu is worth the probability of um, not getting the flu versus taking taking the flu vaccine, getting the flu shot every season. Um, and if you are somebody who comes in contact with people who have compromised immune systems, it's probably a very good idea to like uh, the elderly, people with immunodeficient disorders or children, uh, you probably should get the flu vaccine just to protect those people. Um, the flu vaccine, I'm awesome. I, I, I agree. The flu vaccine is very safe. And people who say that they get the flu from the vaccine are actually incorrect. Uh, you don't get the flu from the flu vaccine. So uh, the the particles that are in the flu vaccine are not active and will not cause a uh, immune response 
to the degree that the real flu would. So you might feel like you are, yeah, you, know, you have a fever, you don't feel good. And it's very possible that uh, coincidentally, you happen to get some other virus, not the flu, but there are lots of other cold viruses that are nasty and make you want to stay in bed. Uh, so the coincidence could mean that it just could line up right that, okay, you got your flu shot, but you happen to catch something around the same time. The And you can have, say, a, uh, an increased fever. Your body might have an, uh, a feeling of the, of the flu because your immune system could, can respond to those, uh, to those protein particles from the flu virus that are being introduced to it. But you're not going to have the flu. Believe me, you are not having the flu. If you've ever had the flu, like really had the flu, you know you're not having the flu. Ah, um, let's see. Let's see, let's see. We can move away from the flu though because we're you know, we're moving moving on from uh the flu. We're moving moving on from flu season. It's getting towards the end of flu season as we're getting into summer, right? Right? Um what other uh, strengths posted a headline? I actually glanced at this headline, but I didn't get a chance to read it, uh, t- to read the study. Hot sauce ingredient reduces beer belly fat as a weight loss surgery alternative. So I, I glanced at it, but didn't really look at it. So let me click on that link really fast and see uh, see what they're talking about. I'm going to guess that they're going to be talking about capsaicin, Uh, Here we go. Yeah. So published in the May issue of Digestive Diseases and Sciences out of Purdue University. Um, Excuse me. Uh, They've published a study investigating whether two surgeries called vagal deafferentation, which uses capsaicin, the component responsible for chili peppers, burning sensation, and vagotomy can achieve weight loss and reduce the risk of obesity-related diseases with fewer side effects when compared to today's bariatric surgical options. And they tested the surgeries in the lab, found that vagotomy significantly reduced total body fat as well as visceral abdominal... Abdominal? No. <laughs> abdominal fat, the beer belly fat that pads the spaces between abdominal organs... Uh, vagal deafferentation also reduced them, but to a lesser degree. So they're probably in this uh, headline. They're preferentially take uh, giving giving highlighting the capsaicin aspect of it because it is you know it's it's sensational. It's hot sauce. Ooh, hot sauce, beer belly. It's like hot wings and beer, right? No. No, this is this has nothing to do. If you're eating spicy hot wings and drinking beer, the likelihood of your reducing your beer belly fat is very minimal. So um, between these, vagal deafferentation is associated with fewer side effects, but it was not as as effective as the vagotomy. So um, yeah, interesting. Vagotomy is uh, the vagus nerve where you sever the vagus nerve and it is... Uh, it severs the connection between the gut and your brain. So they're no longer talking to each other, uh, which could uh, could uh, mean that signals, I mean, hormones are still going to work for hunger, but nerve signals for digestion will be changed. Nerve signals related to hunger will probably be uh, will be will be changed so that the gut will be acting on its own as opposed to responding to maybe the top down cortical control from your brain um interesting vagal deafferentation though uh so the it just gets rid of one the afferent nerves. So it's only certain nerve fibers and they just use the capsaicin to destroy those nerve fibers. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting study. But so it's, it's not hot sauce. You can't just drink hot sauce and get skinny. I know that after this paper, people are going to be jumping on it and being like, Ooh, the hot sauce diet. Yeah. So strengths is asking the hot sauce version still allowed the brain to talk to the gut. Um, 
uh, that's the good. That's the question. I think that what's happening with D uh, afferent, so afferent and efferent. So you have your afferent nerves that go away from the brain, or, or afferent and efferent. I'm getting these mixed up. I haven't looked at this at the. Uh, I haven't looked at the terminology in ages. Afferent versus efferent here at Google. I love you so much. Um, let's see if Google can an- answer this question. Um, uh, afferent carry impulses from the skin to the joint. No, 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 that's the wrong one. Afferent, deafferentation, afferent nerve fine. Is somebody in the chat room going to fix it? Going to answer this. Um, Aha, here we go. From receptors or sense organs toward the central nervous system. That's right. And efferent are the opposite flow. So um, afferent neurons, according to Wikipedia, do you love Wikipedia? Afferent neurons carry nerve impulses from receptors or sense organs toward the central nervous system. So what they would be doing is breaking the loop from the gut to the brain. So there would be no feedback from the gut to the brain, but the efferents from the central nervous system to the gut would still be in working order. So the the brain would still talk to the gut, but the gut would no longer talk to the brain. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So yes, strengths. The hot sauce version still allowed the brain to talk to the gut, just not the other way around. Mm-hmm. And now we are having a conversation about hot sauces. <laughs> What's your favorite hot sauce? Audio Murphy says evidently processed meats are resistant to bacteria if dropped onto the floor. Well, there's going to be a certain amount of um of resistance because they are being processed. They've had nitrates added so that the meats are actually preserved so that they are, um, they actually can last longer. I mean, part of this is you've got your sausages or your bolognese or um, these meats that have been chopped up, mushed up and put into a form that isn't going to go bad immediately. And so in preserving Basically what you do, you've got salts, you've got nitrates, you have things in the meat that uh, that bacteria don't like. And so it's just going to take longer for them to start chewing on, <laughs> chewing on that food source. Uh, let's see, Vesta Asteroid Neuro Zero says, is now a protoplanet. Yeah, now they're calling it a protoplanet, which, I mean, protoplanet, planetesimal, planetoid, it's a virtual planetoid. It's pretty much, uh, I don't know, I think of them all the same way. But I think what what's really interesting about Vesta is that since we're looking at it, we're realizing that it really was um, one of these little chunks of rock that was around that been has been was combining into, uh, something to could have become a planet, but never quite got the the mass to become a planet, what we consider a planet. And uh, but, but but at the same time, has been affected by all sorts of sort of forces through our solar system, so that uh, we can look at it and really look back at how uh, how our solar system uh, formed. What forces were at play? What affected things two billion years ago? That's pretty, pretty awesome to be able to look back that far. Um, uh, Tensor Guy asks, what is my opinion on asteroid mining? Um, Sure, why not? Right? I mean, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest question we get to is, you know, who... Who owns the asteroids? Is it going to be once we get the technology to really get out there and it's not just one company going in asteroid mine uh, and mining the asteroids, is it going to turn into an asteroid gold rush or is there going to be because it's such a difficult 
journey to get off of our planet and into space to be able to mine the asteroids, that it won't end up being uh, a gold rush and that because there's such a high threshold to involvement that it'll really be limited to corporations and governments. So um, I think it's, you know, I would rather we mine asteroids than open up places like Alaska to the biggest um, mining operations in basically the history of the Americas. Uh, is something that I was reading about recently. Um, there's a giant, giant uh, mine that's planned or they're working on trying to get it uh, to get it in to a very sensitive ecological area in Alaska. And so if we can get to space and mine asteroids and use those minerals here on Earth and also to our benefit in space, why not do that? I mean, who's worried about the ecology of an asteroid? I'm not, right? But I'm worried about the ecology, the environment in Alaska. I would... I would much rather save uh, very important salmon spawning grounds, uh, very sensitive watersheds, uh, amazing places for uh, just fisheries and, and hunting and wildlife viewing and you know, just beautiful places that we, you know, instead of, instead of putting a giant mine in that will end up with leaving miles and miles and miles of uh, toxic uh, tailing ponds. I don't remember exactly what the name of the uh, the mining operation is going to be, but I vote asteroids. <laughs> That's right. Dale Poco says we should brand asteroids like cattle. You can put your mark on it. I think that could be it. Maybe maybe that's what maybe that's what companies will begin doing. Um, Tensor Guy says ownership is the big outstanding issue. Yeah, so I think ownership with all things space related are going to be the big issue, especially since we really don't have an international government. We still have, you know, countries and corporations that are vying to get into space to do things for their country or, you know, for their corporations, uh, for their shareholders' pocketbooks. So it would be really amazing to actually find a way to have all of humanity own these asteroids. But, um, you know, I don't think that's going to necessarily happen. Uh, let's see. I'm Awesome says, now that there's no constellation, how are we going to get people to Mars? SpaceX? <laughs> I don't know. If uh, SpaceX can get their stuff together, uh, they, a date has been set uh, at last hearing, I guess May 19th is the date for an attempted test of the SpaceX systems that are to be, uh, or for the launch of a test docking with the International Space Station of the Falcon rocket. Um, so we'll see if that works. But, you know, if SpaceX is getting stuff into space, then maybe SpaceX will be getting people into space. And if that works, then maybe, you know, private companies are going to be the way to go. It certainly seems like partnerships with private companies are the direction, uh, are the direction that NASA is, is headed at this point. There are plenty of partnerships uh, in, the, in the making. As there's certainly not a lot of government mo government money coming to NASA to start new <laughs> new manned missions uh, or get things underway. Let's see. Sunny Manitoba says Federation of Planets sponsored by a mining consortium. Right. <laughs> uh, Reposter says, uh, "Don't worry about that. Take them to the Mars simulator in Russia. Right. It's cheaper. Just you know, it's airplane flight. Go to Russia. Mars simulator. Everything is." Hunky dory. Um, let's see. Uh, Chaos Chaos Star thirteen says, "I thought SpaceX stuff was good. It was a NASA delay this time. Well, actually, the uh, SpaceX has been uh, mucking about with some of their software, which." That's fine. You can update your software as much as you want, but you need to make sure that it's going to work with the uh, systems that are in place at the International Space Station. And that's not saying that they wouldn't, but uh, NASA has protocols in place to be sure that everything will 
work without a hitch. Uh, you don't want to send something or even if it's not manned, there are people on the International Space, Space Station. And so anything that goes wrong could, uh, could be dire. Could be dire. <laughs> Reposter says that somehow SpaceX sounds like a company that's destined to fail. And you say this based purely on the name. Now, I'm curi curious about this because I thought that anything that added X to it automatically was supposed to have a cool factor that would uh, imply its success, right? Right? Doesn't X, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You had yeah, yeah, X is extreme, right, Sunny Manitoba? <laughs> I don't know psychologically if if that's actually true, but yeah, experiment I space <laughs> the X Men, the Xbox, exactly. Add an X to it; it's extra cool, extra cool. Um. Mont Blancopo says, if anyone should know about the importance of getting software right, it should be NASA. Agreed. They've had, uh, they've had stuff go wrong in the past. And so I think they've learned from their uh, past mistakes and are working hard to uh, not have rep repetitions uh, in the future. <sighs> Web 255 Excalibur. But you would have to start it with just an X, right? Excalibur. I think that would be the way it would work. Um, Tech Dude is asking, what do I think of the private privatization of the space industry? I, I think it's actually uh, beneficial in the long run. Um, as it stands, we've had a number of, uh, you know, the public companies, the NASA, European Space a Agency, um, uh, you know, government organizations that do things, have missions to the moon that do not, they're paid for with public money, uh, but are not, uh, not necessarily always in uh, the public's best interest. And uh, as the, I mean, not saying that a private company would have the public's best interest at heart, but uh, if they are funded by uh, people buying stuff, things being paid for, uh, there's possibly, you know, the competition that would be inherent in the privatization could lead to much more rapid jumps in the technology and more rapid jumps in our abilities, our ability to get things done and, and get into outer space as opposed to a lot of the government um, shackles. Government just holds things back and then there's, you know, keeping things quiet and you never quite know what's going on until they give a press conference. I don't know. I think, I think it's privatization is great. And I think it's going to lead to some really exciting things. I think, um, doctor, let's see strengths. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, strengths brings up a story. Brain scans unleash canine secrets. Wow, I don't know that story. You're you're bringing up stories that I haven't seen today. What is your dog thinking? So, Public Library of Science Plus One is published has published the results of an experiment showing how the brains of dogs react to hand signals given by owners, and they used functional magnetic resonance imaging to be able to uh, to do this. The director of the Emory Center for Neuropolicy, Greg, Gregory Burns, says it was amazing to see the first brain images of a fully awake, unrestrained dog. As far as we know, no one has been able to do this previously. We hope this opens up a whole new door for understanding canine, canine cognition. And so there's a video um, and Cranky Hippo in the control booth. If uh, you could bring up that video, it would be neat to see um, the dog human. Yeah. Just one moment, please. Just one moment. I'd love to see the the dog fMRI study. It sounds really interesting. I especially how they say unrestrained. I'd love to know how they actually how they did this. So they trained dogs to respond to hand signals. One signal meant the dog would re receive a hot dog treat. Another signal meant it would not read receive one. 
The caudate region of the brain associated with rewards in humans showed activation in both dogs when they saw the signal for the treat, but not for the no treat sync signal. <laughs> these results indicate that dogs pay very close attention to human signals. And these signals may have a direct line to the dog's reward system. Unless you're not giving them a reward. No hot dog. Your dog is not responding to that. Fascinating. <laughs> so the researcher says, this is really, really interesting. The researcher, uh, Gregory Burns, he says, um, I was, um, I, this, is, this is crazy. He learned years ago, a unit U.S. Navy dog had been a member of the SEAL team that, I guess not years ago, a little while ago, U.S. Navy dog had been a member of the SEAL team that killed Osama bin Laden. Quote, I was amazed when I saw the pictures of what military dogs can do. I realized that if dogs can be trained to jump out of helicopters and airplanes, we could certainly train them to go into an fMRI to see what they're thinking. <laughs> I think that's great. And that's one reason why he did not study cats. <laughs> brought to you by Emory University. Let's see what this is. The dog project was hatched almost a year ago. And really the idea is to use brain imaging to figure out what dogs are really thinking. So there's all sorts of theories about my dog loves me, my dog thinks this, but how can we really know because they can't talk to us. So the inspiration for the project was literally on the mission that hunted down Osama bin Laden and it was revealed pretty much a few days after that that there was a dog on the SEAL team um, that did that mission. Turns out, I mean, there's obviously uh, a lot of dogs in the military, uh, and they're trained to do all sorts of tasks. The main task being um, scent detection for explosives and, and narcotics, and as well as patrol duty. I realized if dogs can be, can be trained to jump out of uh, airplanes and helicopters, we could certainly train them to go into an MRI so we could see what they're thinking. So the task itself is quite complicated because Callie has to walk up some steps to go on to the patient table in the MRI, go in the MRI, shimmy down and stick her head in what we call a head coil, and then hold still. Wow. And fMRIs are so loud. Hey, that's good. Look at brain. Look at that. Look at that. <gasps> there are several brains there. Now that is, <laughs> that's I'm one impressed. Of brains. That is awesome. He's going to be so excited. Yay! 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 So when we saw those first images, uh, you know, it was unlike anything else. Um, nobody, as far as I know, had ever captured images of a dog's brain that wasn't sedated. I mean, this was a fully awake, unrestrained dog, and here we had a picture for the first time ever of her brain, and it was incredible. If we can actually capture brain images and see what parts of the brain are activating, when we give hand signals or when we talk to it or when we point this way or that way, now we can really begin to understand what a dog is thinking. We hope this opens a whole new door into canine cognition, social cognition of other species, and you know, really opening um, and, and really paving the way uh, for understanding interspecies communication. And you know, we think the dogs are the best for this. Um, we have a, a mock-up of a scanner at home in our living room and so she knows when I say you want to do some training she goes and hops right up in the simulator and um, waits for her treats. Any dog person wants to know what their dog is thinking. But to the skeptics out there and the cat people um, I would say you know looking at the dog human relationship is unique. There are no other animals like dogs. Um, they are the first domesticated species and as such it really is like anthropology like we're almost looking at fossils because the dog's brain represents something very special about humans and animals how they came together thousands of years ago and it's possible even that dogs have affected human evolution that the people who took dogs into their homes and their villages may have had certain advantages and there could be traits in those ancestor, ancestors of ours um, 
such as the ability to communicate with animals, social qualities that make them um, better mates um, and better people. So the reason to care is that, you know, as much as we made dogs, you know, I think dogs probably made some part of us too. <laughs> looks looks delicious. Bone. Right down right now the uh the reward system in that dog is like happy, 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 chew on bone, happy, 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 happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. And um, I think that's a really interesting uh, interesting way to approach animal brain research because one of the biggest problems that we've had is the voluntary aspect of it. So most animals will not do something like that voluntarily. Um, and so you do have to restrain the animals. And by restraining the animal, you are automatically changing the way that it's going to behave. You're probably introducing a lot of fear uh, factors either. And if it's not just restrained, but, um, but sedated, then you're really not getting all the activation that you could be from, from that animal's brain. Um, so using dogs, really, really interesting. And I love the fact that they were using little doggy headphones Ear, doggy ear protection for <laughs> for the uh, the fMRI because MRI machines are extremely loud if you didn't hear it from that video they are if you've ever been inside of one there's a lot of loud noise it's not so not so fun um Nard Dog says, do I ever think there will be a pill to use 100% of our brains so we use probably uh just about as much of our brains as we need to use, whether or not uh, we are uh, trained in effective habits is another question. And whether or not we have, um, uh, you know, our brain pathways, the neuronal pathways have been set up efficiently and effectively is, a, is another question. So uh, the old uh, idea that we only use about 10% of our brain, not true not true. We use almost all of our brain at any given moment in time. Of course, not all of the neurons are going to be active at every moment. There's some resting at every point in time. Some are active. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, you're going to have different amounts of activation. So right now I probably have uh, activation related to visual input, auditory input, and my vocal centers are active. I've also got um, uh, sensory information coming in from the air, my chair, muscles are being activated to keep me upright. So there's, uh, I'm breathing. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot that is actually working constantly to uh, keep everything going. So if you, yeah, if you, strength says uh, using 100% of your brain is your brain having a seizure. Exactly. <laughs> so that would be an epilepsy pill. Um, yeah. If you were actually using 100% of your brain, that wouldn't necessarily be helpful because uh, it, that would mean that all of your neurons would be active at the same moment in time. And if they're all active and talking to each other, then what's happening? It's it, it's like a brain, it would be a brainstorm. And that's what an epileptic fit is, an epileptic seizure is the result of. And so that's too much activation of the brain. So you really do want certain neurons to be inactive or uh, told to be quiet at certain points in time. Uh, you want others to be very specifically active uh, so that you can behave in the most effective way possible for your environment. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting question, though, uh, or an I the interesting idea that you don't actually want to be 100% on your brain to be 100% on at any point in time. Um, Web123 uh, compares it to a computer. Why would you want it to be at 100% all the time? You wouldn't because the fan would be going and you'd be like, oh, my computer's going to die any minute. I'm waiting for that spinning rainbow or the blue screen of death, right? Yeah, you don't want that in real life. You don't want that. Um Mossum also brings up the fact that glia are highly involved in neuronal activity as well. 
And that's very true. Uh, glia, which used to be thought of just, just as packing material, actually are highly active in the functioning of neurons and um, probably act. We had a we had a whole show on glia one uh, one episode last year, I think. Um, woman with a French accent who I'm forgetting her name right now. And it was a little bit technical. So I think a lot of people tuned out on that episode. Uh, but it was really interesting because it was about uh, glia and this uh, new role that we know them to play now, which is uh, that they, they're probably involved in very local signal, signal, signaling and actually probably send signals themselves to neurons and affect the way that the main information carriers or neurons actually carry that information and send it on to lead to different behaviors. Um, somebody asked earlier, and I'm going to jump on it talking about brainstorms. What about solar storms? Um, <clears throat> the question of whether or not we're still looking forward to giant solar storms this year that could knock out um, uh, technological abilities that could knock out our electrical infrastructure, could knock out our communication satellites, could knock out all sorts of things. And why, yes, yes, we are. And we're not looking forward to it necessarily next year, could be next year, but we we are in the middle of a very active period in the on the sun. And if you uh, are interested in seeing what's going on, uh, you can go to the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And this is a uh, a NASA mission, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, where we have monitors, these just monitors in space looking at the sun and checking out what kind of acti activity is going on. And there's some beautiful pictures that are uh, are available. And if you're on Google+, Plus, Camilla Corona SDO is the, is the chicken that you want to be following. And yes, I did say chicken. Camilla Corona SDO is who you would like to follow. Um, so interestingly enough, there is ha, there's been a lot of activity very recently on the other side of the sun. So the sun itself rotates as we orbit around it and rotate on our own axis, um, but the sun itself does rotate. And so for a while, it's been really nice. We've been like, oh yeah, there's all this activity and it's on the other side and there have been some massive solar flares, but they haven't been directed at us. So we haven't had the brunt of them yet. But uh, from May 8th, a post by Colum Camilla Corona on Google Plus says, today around 1300 UT, the large active region on the sun, 1476, showed its power once again, unleashing a M1.4 class solar flare. And she, uh, there's an image that goes along with this. The image can be seen through the 131 Angstrom channel, we can see extremely hot temperatures around 10 million degrees Kelvin or 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. M-class solar flares can cause brief radio at blackouts that affect Earth's polar regions. Minor radiation storms sometimes follow an M-class flare. Since this active region is now getting perfectly situated to cause space weather events, which would now impact Earth, scientists are keeping their eyes on AR1476. Yeah, so we are still, we're, we're checking out the sun and the Solar Dynamics Observatory is allowing us to do that right now in a way that we've never been able to do before. It's just beautiful, beautiful. Um, Reposter says, are we always seeing the same side of the sun or does it change? No, we're, it, it changes. So since the sun is rotating and we're in orbit, so it's it's spinning on its axis, and then we're spinning, we're going around it at our own orbital speed. And um, yeah, our view of the sun is always changing, and uh, and the the sun's surface as well is always changing. So um, we have uh, active regions pop up, and that we must monitor at some point. Um, I Mossum says, I want to hear about geomagnetic reversal. You know, that's a topic that I've had interest in, but it, I haven't actually gotten an interview. I at one point wanted to get somebody on the show to talk to about geomagnetic reversal, um, but it didn't come to pass, unfortunately. So great idea. <laughs> Maybe I will schedule somebody for the next time that I uh, don't have a guest. 
which is May 31st. That's the next time I don't have a guest. We'll see what I can do for that. Um, the, uh, the geomagnetic reversal, so our Earth's poles north-south, the way that we see them, uh, reverse, according to geologists, uh, based on uh, magnetic iron filings and how they're laid down uh, uh, in, in sediments of the Earth throughout history. So um, every 27,000 years, something like that, um, and the geomagnetic reversal pole switch. North becomes south, south becomes north. It shouldn't really affect stuff, but it, it could. So we have our main, uh, our main poles, north and south, or I should put it on axis because that would be more accurate, I guess, for our planet. Um, and what's interesting is that this is supposed to be the result of the spinning iron core, Right of our of our planet, we have the uh, the spinning molten and uh, material inside of our planet, and and that iron core, and it's creating a magnetic field. Now, the molten aspect of the core is also di- very dynamic, and so there are these little minor magnetic eruptions that come out. And so, uh, something that I read. Um, not recently, but a little while ago, mentioned that as uh, as we look at it and what, what they think is happening is as we get closer to a reversal, we'll see more of a disruption of the straight north and south relationship that we have. And we'll see lots of north and south signals appearing all over the earth as the uh, the flow, the dynamic flow is change as it changes and as it shifts but you know i don't know yeah there's a uh, bill in michigan i'm guessing that's right asks isn't reversal assumed to be some kind of convection change yeah and so that's the um the uh, the molten aspect so the um uh, it's not i guess not the core core but yeah there's there's some there's some kind of convection change and that's where you get the dynamic aspect as it changes. And eventually the convection will decide, oh, we're going to shift and this will be north and this will be south or this will be still south and this will be north. But in the meantime, it might be a little messy, which, which is interesting. It would be very interesting. I don't know enough about it, obviously. So uh, it's definitely something that I want to learn more about. And uh, if you guys know anything about it, let me know. And I will try and get somebody on the show to talk about it. Who knows about geomagnetic reversal? Uh, Flesh TH and uh, (laughs) could be, it's not the kind of thing, it's not going to be a doomsday like thing. Flesh TH says birds will fly into buildings and earthquakes. And wait a minute, this is going to sound very familiar probably not going to be that messy because yeah it probably is not going to be that messy but yeah we need to we need to debunk that and uh i need an expert to do that efficiently Mm -hmm. and in terms of how long the reversal takes uh that's what bill is asking again hours centuries i think it's more on uh on the on the rate of centuries, but researchers don't know. Because when you look at stuff in the geological record, sometimes it's not easy to get that high resolution to know exactly how rapid something took, rapidly something took place. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right, JC Wayne, you'll have to wait until the doomsday types recover from the world not ending on 1221 before doing a full show on pole reversal. <laughs> Exactly. Um, Interesting. Another really interesting question. And this I find personally interesting. Somebody, Somebody posted about the Time magazine cover. Here it is. Sunny Manitoba says Time magazine's latest issue shows a woman on the cover breastfeeding her three-year-old son. Have there been any studies to show as to when breastfeeding is no longer necessary? Uh, necessary? No. So we, we know that breastfeeding is not 
necessary. <laughs> so uh, in terms of there's necessary versus sufficient. And that's just, it's a terminology different, but difference. But I think that terminology is very important in this case. So um, necessary Breastfeeding is not necessary. We have lots of individuals who lead, uh, who develop just fine with uh, formula feeding, who are never, uh, for whatever reason, their mothers don't produce milk, they don't latch on, something doesn't happen, they don't breastfeed. There are, um, there are lots of infants that have never had uh, a breast or breast milk necessarily. Um, there is research, however, that sh that shows that breast milk is uh, is good for the immune system and immune development. It's good for the uh, brain and brain development. It is good for social development. There are all sorts of aspects to breastfeeding that have shown that have been shown to uh, to aid in the development of a human being. Necessary? No. Sufficient? Yes. Now, the question of when is it okay? When do you stop breastfeeding? Um, and this is a big thing that's come up recently, and there's no scientific evidence uh, or there's no, there's no science that suggests that a woman ever has to stop breastfeeding her children. But socially, we, uh, we decide uh, when to stop breastfeeding. And there was a cultural and social shift um, when women decided uh, en masse to go, back, to go into the workforce. And so there was a very big shift in what was okay and when um, and how long, for how long women would feed their children. So now um, it's a really interesting question because a lot of women are pushing... Um, Breastfeeding, breastfeeding was not acceptable for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, the the science says it's good for a baby to be breast breastfed for many different reasons. Um, but we're just getting into a period of cultural acceptance of breastfeeding once again, and there's a group of people who are pushing for much longer periods of breastfeeding, even until a child is three, four, five years old in some cases. Um, whether or not that's culturally appropriate is for uh, people to decide, and uh, it's not necessarily a scientific question at all. I mean, it could be if you start talking about it in terms of psychological development. So, um, and I don't know that anybody has done those studies. So it's a really interesting question. It's a very interesting question. And I'm going to keep my mouth shut on my opinion at this point in time. But, you know, I have, I have things I'd love to talk about. <laughs> but I don't know if the science hour is the appropriate outlet for it. Um, let's see. Uh, Nard Dog says, why is the universe expanding faster and faster? I don't know. It's that... Pesky dark energy. Pesky, pesky dark energy. Right? <sighs> dark energy, which we really don't even know what it is. And for all things dark matter and dark energy related, I just go to... Um, oh, and I'm totally going to blink on his name right now. I've interviewed him a couple of times. Sean. Um, oh, there's a child outside. The child wants to come in. Mm. Yeah, I can't remember his name offhand, but he he writes the blog Cosmic Var he writes on on the blog Cosmic Variants and I've had him on the show a couple of times and he's fantastic and I will always just I'll just talk to him about it. <laughs> um I think that it's probably about time for me to end this show. I did start it a little bit late, uh, but uh, but at the same time, we don't want to keep everyone from the next great hour of programming on the Twit Network. Um, Bill, you get the last word in here because this is a great question. Sean Carroll, thank you, Rain Dog. Sean Carroll, I know I did the chat room. You guys have all the answers. Um, 
Bill in Michigan says, have you ever heard the hypothesis that the speed of light may not have been constant since the Big Bang, which would change everything? Yes, I have heard that hypothesis. Um, it's a very interesting hypothesis, and it's a, it's a, a possibility, which I find very fascinating. Um, the addition, additional uh, aspect to that is that our universe, we think of it, or physicists think of it as homogenous, where all of the... Um, the parameters of the universe, uh, the speed of light, gravitational constant, all these things are the same throughout the entire universe. Evidence suggests that they are not, that a, we have a heterogeneous universe and that uh, our universe is not the same all the way around, which would possibly affect the speed of light in different pockets of the universe even now. Oof. I think my brain just warped. But anyway, um, we will get to... Uh, do I know Dr. Carl from Australia? I met him once at a conference. He had no idea who I was, and I was a little fangirl. But I know of Dr. Carl from Australia, and I have much respect for the work that he does. He would be a great guest on the show if... Um, I guess the show would be like in the middle of the night for him, though, which might be kind of difficult. Um I'm going to finish this show. I'm awesome. Said I should have on doctors Vincent Racaniello and Dixon de Pommier of This Week in Virology and This Week in Parasitism. I should, uh, I've spoken with Vincent uh, Racaniello before. We have an episode. Uh, if you look in the, in the do Dr. Key Science Hour archive of, uh, of a show with Dr. Racaniello, Vince Dixon de Pommier, I have not had on. And so, hmm. That would be an interesting one. I love parasites. Parasites are a lot of fun. Good suggestion. I will hunt him down. Um, and Mark8675 is telling me that it's 8.20 a.m. in Sydney right now. So that's a perfect time for an interview. I love it. I love it. Dr. Carl, you're on my list as well. So <laughs> thank you, Nard Dog. <laughs> I had, I, you're right. I had no agenda today and it turned out all right. Every once in a while... You got to go a little bit uh, off plan and just see where it takes you. Uh, Reposter, it's 10, it says it's 1025. You're sitting at your desk in Sydney. I'm glad you're watching the show. Thank you very much from, for watching from Sydney. Um, who, uh, who else? We, have, we probably have people from all over the world watching the show right now. Sparkling cyanide says it's 821 p.m. in Michigan. And, uh, <laughs> and, oh, that's right. That's right. But this is for a later show. This is for a later show. I'm going to finish this show. Really? I'm good. Somebody says they're from Mars. Yeah. Cranky hippo. All right. I'm rapping. London. We have Britman from London. Cranky hippos at Twit Brick House Studio. Zach is from Mars. <laughs> Okay, everybody, I'm going to end this show here. I'm Dr. Kiki, and this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Chatting Hour, which has been a lot of fun for me, and I hope it was fun for you. Uh, next week, we are going to be speaking with Dr. David Agus, MD, about his book, The End of Illness. So uh, I'm interested in hearing what he has to say about the end of illness. And that's what we'll be discussing next week. And in the meantime, you can catch me all over the interwebs, Google Plus. I'm Kiki Sanford. Everywhere else, I'm Dr. Kiki. And you can subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. Watch that Vincent Racaniello episode if you go to twit.tv slash Kiki. And if you need any more science -y goodness, you can catch This Week in Science Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time here on the Twit Network. I also do the science chat over on Justin TV slash Dr. Kiki, 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific time. It's kind of like this last hour was. That's tomorrow at noon and I will be there and I hope that you are too. I will see you next week. Thank you for making my science chatting hour so much fun. All I ask is one hour a week, really. And remember, I hope that this one hour a week makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Now, for your science meditation of the week.
the veins of a leaf. Its underlying vascular system revealed here with a little fluorescent dye and time-lapse photography. That vascular network is key to the leaf's structure and delivers nutrients to all its cells. If you begin looking at them in, in any degree of detail, you'll see all of these beautiful, uh, you know, arrangement of impinging angles and where the big veins meet the, uh, the little veins and how well arranged they are. Rockefeller University mathematical physicists Marcelo Magnasco and Elena Catafori light up leaves to study their vascular networks. They say a leaf's veins are a great model system for understanding the link between function and geometric structure in living things. Turns out Mother Nature is a great architect. The nature is something that looks pretty, looks pretty for a really good reason, because it really has a very well-defined and elegant function. In the leaves that we're looking at, we can scan them at extremely high resolution and reconstruct every single little piece of vein. Who talks to who, who is connected to who, what are the diam diameters, and so on and so forth. They study vascular loops within loops, a pattern that repeats itself all the way down to microscopic levels. Nutrients flow through them, even bypassing a hole in the main vein. Nature has found a way to keep the leaf functional even after it has been damaged. Mignasco and Catafori digitally dissect these patterns level by level to understand their complex relationships. We hit on the idea that what we should do is start at the very bottom, having all of our individual little, uh, little loops, and then begin merging them. Mignasco says his research is a jumping off point for understanding the mathematics behind other systems that branch and rejoin. Everything from river deltas to neural networks, even malignant tumors. When a tumor becomes malignant, uh, it, it vascularizes. Understanding all of these is, uh, is, is extremely important for understanding how these things work. It's the math behind nature's mechanics, perfectly illustrated by this foliage with a little flair. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien.